Welcome, everyone. My name is Arik Burakovsky, and I manage the Russia and Eurasia program here at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And it's my great pleasure to begin this event. We are pleased to collaborate with Sahumi State University in Tbilisi, Georgia, on this uh, event, which promises to be a fascinating discussion on the political, economic, and security ramifications of the war between Russia and Ukraine for the South Caucasus. And that includes Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, as well as the regional conflicts in Nagorno-Karabakh, Abkhazia, and South Ossetia. Um, I am delighted to collaborate with my uh, colleague, Lasha Kasradze. He is an alumnus of the Fletcher School's GMAP program, and he is also the US uh, liaison officer for Sukhumi State University. We are also honored to be joined by Dr. Zurab Kanalidze, the rector of Sukhumi State University. Uh, and we look forward to hosting him at Fletcher next month to discuss uh, his latest book, The Georgian Paradigm for Peace, which is on university diplomacy, creating a platform for uh, negotiation uh, across the South Caucasus to build peace uh, in a, a coherent and holistic way. So we very much look forward to uh, to having you at the Fletcher School soon. I will now turn it over to Lasha to introduce the Georgian uh, participants. Then I will introduce the participants on the U.S. side. And then we will have uh, seven minutes for each panelist to give opening remarks. So, Lasha, over to you. Arik, thank you very much for your kind uh, words and warm introduction, very generous introduction. Uh, I'll be glad to introduce our esteemed guests. Um, <clears throat> Professor Vahdan Charaya is an economist and the Dean of Business and Management School at Grigol Robakidze University uh, in 2018 and 2019. The Ministry of Education, Science and Culture of Georgia named Mr. Charaya uh, the best young scientist of Georgia. Mr. Petra Mamradze is a politician uh, and a member of, former member of the parliament. Um, um, he holds a doctorate in theoretical physics and mathematical sciences, uh, and he is a recipient of prestigious Knight of the Order of Merit Reward in 2006. Last, lastly, um, Mr. Malhas Kagabadze was an ambassador extraordinary and plenipotentiary of Georgia to the Kingdom of Sweden and the Republic of Finland between 2016 and 2021. He was also head of the Parliament uh, Mission of Georgia in the United Nations. Um, Mr. Kakabaze successfully initiated and negotiated European Union supported post conflict rehabilitation projects in Sri Valley region of Georgia. Darik, I think we can uh, back to you and we can move on. Thanks, Lasha. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, two additional uh, distinguished panelists. Uh, Maya Otarashvili is the research fellow and deputy director of the Eurasia program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, FPRI. She also serves as deputy director of research at FPRI. And Jeffrey Taliaferum is a professor of political science at Tufts University, where he has taught since 1997. His research and teaching focus on security studies, international relations theory, international history and politics, grand strategies of the great powers, US foreign policy, intelligence, and cybersecurity. Lasha, over to you. So gentlemen, uh, we can get started uh, on your end. Uh, please, as we discussed, uh, uh, you are limited to five to seven minutes uh, uh, to make your <clears throat> uh, introductory statements. Uh, on the uh, Russia's aggression uh, in Ukraine and its effects on Georgia and the South Caucasus. I hope everyone can hear me there in Tbilisi. Mr. Charaya, if you'd like, you can start first. Or... 
Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Casazza. There is a noise. I think we we have a strong echo. Yes. Uh, Oh, hello again. Get the voice okay? I think it's much better now. Yes. Okay. So, dear uh, colleagues, dear uh, friends and uh, partners, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, and uh, um, for sharing my ideas. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I will be glad to uh, answer your questions, any of your questions uh, in regard to my uh, speech. So. First of all, let me underline that uh, Russia-Ukrainian war affected Georgia directly and indirectly, both positively and negatively. So uh, it depends on the aspects of the economy, let's say, uh, you are discussing uh, or uh, uh, the um, uh, part of the Georgian economy you are discussing where, where, when you want to estimate how positive or negative the Russia Russian aggression to Ukraine war. So let me uh, see in some of the negative aspects of uh, this effect. Uh, so um, if we consider from the negative perspective, of course, Georgia uh, is hugely affected by the Russian-Ukrainian war because both uh, countries uh, were uh, in top 10 of uh, trading partners and economic partners uh, for Georgia. Uh, Russia even was, uh, depending on different years, even number one or number two trading partner to Georgia, uh, while Ukraine also was significant uh, trading partner for Georgia. Also, uh, these countries uh, were interesting for Georgia uh, from the investment point of view, from the tourism perspective, from the uh, financial remittances point of view and uh, some, some other areas as well. Uh, so um, uh, Georgia was hugely affected uh, in terms of uh, prices to summarize all these directions. Uh, Georgia was um, uh, uh, affected in terms of um, increasing inflation in Georgia uh, while, while uh, it um, brought huge challenges uh, not only to the country but also to the uh, I mean not only to the uh, government but also to the uh, citizens of uh, Georgia because uh, Georgia you know uh, is not rich country it's relatively poor developing country which um, which which uh, uh, is significantly affected by the double digit inflation which is uh, partially and at uh, a large level uh, is uh, affected uh, by the uh, Russia-Ukrainian war. Uh, but from the uh, positive perspective, uh, also to say a few words about the positive perspective, Georgia is using a relatively better, it's a geopolitical uh, situation. And uh, from the transit perspective, Georgia uh, has attained some uh, more uh, cargo, more um, uh, more companies and more uh, countries uh, are nowadays interested in the transit through Georgia than it was ever before. So uh, it gives Georgia uh, 
some op new opportunities um, to to, to uh, promote its location, to promote its um, advantages, to promote uh, doing business in Georgia. So from that perspective, it would be positive. But uh, overall, if you ask me if uh, overall it's more positive or more negative, I would say that from the economic perspective, it's uh, more negative than positive. Uh, I mean, the Russia-Ukrainian war. Also, um, Russia-Ukrainian war affected Georgia from the... Uh, uh, conflict resolution or peace building point of view, you know, that uh, Georgia has to unsolve conflicts within uh, the country uh, and uh, uh, the um, uh, these two uh, regions uh, of Georgia, which promote, uh, which are uh, declared independent by the Russian Federation, but uh, uh, almost no one in the world uh, agrees on that issue. Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, particular uh, regions um, uh, nowadays uh, are in a kind of strange position when they uh, when they want uh, Russian support, but at the same time when they uh are not so willing to be really close to russian federation and some opportunities for georgia uh to to offer some uh, new um opportunities to abkhazian and uh ossetian um, people uh, people uh in georgia uh there is quite a room for that uh opportunity i would say uh but at the same time also um not to make uh, not to make the uh, um, the reality exaggerate too much and uh, to to be on the uh, uh, realistic point of view. I would say that um, of course there are some new opportunities uh, for uh, Georgian Abkhaz and Georgian Ossetian uh, collaboration. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's really hard to implement in real life because uh, despite the fact that we know that uh, nowadays uh, and in this regard, Abkhazians more uh, are willing to cooperate with Georgia, we know that uh, uh, it's not so easy for Georgians and uh, Abkhaz people to communicate directly and uh, to uh, create some uh, joint projects and ventures um, uh, only uh, like by themselves, uh, and the Russian uh, involvement, uh, directly or indirect involvement of Russia, is quite significant uh, in this regard. And uh, Georgia is not uh, simply uh, Georgia is not simply uh, able uh, to put its own policy on the table, uh, as well as Abkhazians are not uh, able to put that. So um, uh, uh, some new opportunities uh, emerged these days, uh, but at the same time, they are very hard to implement. Uh, also, uh, here I would like to underline that uh, uh, the economic situation in uh, those occupied regions uh, is becoming uh, worse, I would say, um, uh, because, because uh, uh, you know that uh, the so-called uh, budgets of these uh, um, occupied territories uh, approximately by half uh, were subsidized by the Russian Federation. So uh, there is some... Um, <clears throat> um, so Russians are uh, uh, pushing Abkhazians uh, to be more loyal to them, to get this uh, funding in the future, uh, while Abkhazians also understand, as well as uh, um, South Ossetian uh, uh, Trinvali region uh, population is also understanding that, uh, understand that uh, the money they get uh, from Russian Federation uh, is not so cheap, so to say, and it's not... Uh, Mm, uh, just a friendly donation from Russian Federation. They have to pay, uh, maybe even with their real lives uh, for that money. So uh, that that uh, gives some new opportunities uh, for um, uh, for uh, peace building uh, between Georgians and Abkhazians and Georgians and the Ossetians. But uh, but but again, I I would I will repeat it many times that um, it's not so easy. 
uh, to to find um, common grounds for cooperation. Despite the fact there are some uh, really interesting projects uh, uh, that the Georgian government is offering for quite a long time, let's say some medical programs or educational programs or programs related to a different, uh, let's say COVID, uh, COVID related issues as well. Uh, the Georgian government is quite um, uh, open uh, in help uh, to, Abkhazians and um, Ossetians, but uh, at the same time, um, uh, it's kind of, of a problem that uh, even the uh, facts uh, when uh, Georgia is supporting uh, these occupied territories uh, are not usually uh, uh, disclosed and it's not usually said openly. So uh, the most of the projects which uh, Georgian government is implementing in uh, Abkhazia or uh, Tsinwali region are uh, are not for press and uh, is not uh, it's not for for public in general. It's uh, it is well known for some uh, people here in Tbilisi or over there in those occupied territories, but um, uh, but not for for each and every uh, people in those occupied territories or within even Georgia. So. Um, uh, when we have such a reality, it's a little bit hard to uh, even to use this opportunity which we have right now, because uh, uh, some people in uh, those occupied territories believe that Georgia uh, is doing almost nothing for them, uh, uh, even more that Georgia is enemy for them, uh, while Georgian government and Georgian society at large is uh, uh, hugely supporting uh, different projects. Uh, in those occupied territories. So uh, overall impact of Russia-Ukrainian war for some time in the future uh, could be both positive and both uh, as well as negative. Uh, and I believe it's a little bit uh, too early today to say that uh, it will give uh, more benefits or disadvantages to Georgia. Uh, because uh, since we don't know yet uh, how, how the uh this war will continue or, or we don't know for sure how it will end uh, i believe it's a little bit early to um, speak about the uh, final results of uh, georgian abkhazian or georgian ossetian um, uh, potential cooperation so uh that would be in short what i will want to say uh so far thank you Uh, there is no your voice, Mr. Kasradze. Can you hear me now? No, oh, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, Mr. Petre Mamradze, you are next, sir. <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, very well. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Thanks for being here. Now, I will start the situation in Georgia at the beginning of, you know, this conflict in February. Well, uh, perhaps, you know, many people know that from 2008, two regions of Georgia, are occupied by Russia. Russia recognizes them as independent states, Abkhazia and former South Ossetia. And even more, most of people there have Russian citizenships. They have Russian passport, and this is very important. I could add to it that after it, you know, till 2012, in Sarkashvili's time, all valuable assets in Georgia, hydropower plants, let's say, manganese, gold, and copper, you know, industry, whatever, even, you know, water supply of Tbilisi or electric supply of Tbilisi was given to Russian businessmen. 
So Akashvili's president of Georgia used to say very anti-Russian, you know, slogans and, you know, uh, position himself as very mm -hmm. pro-Western, but some Western scientists like Lincoln Mitchell, they knew truth and they, you know, wrote who is doing Russia's beat in Georgia. They named Saakashvili for it. But this is how we met because, you know, after the Dream Party came to power and they are in power now for 10 years now, you know, they are, uh, you know, having this, you know, fragile balance because borderization process or process of swallowing Georgian villages around South Ossetia continues even now, which is quite painful for population. And I have to add that since 2008, August, we have no diplomatic relations with Russia. They were cut in August 2008 and never, never, uh, you know, reestablished, of course. To compare Ukraine cut relations with Russia, diplomatic relations, on, only now after the you know, events in February, I think it happened in March or whatever. So this is where we were. So what happens here? And uh, uh, where are, what are the challenges in front of our government? I used to criticize our government, you know, all these years, but I have to admit so far so good. They keep this balance, you know, from one side, our government joined all you know, initiatives of Western partners against Russia. I mean, you know, uh, voting in UN, in uh, uh, also in Europe, etc. We even initialed this Hague investigation. Georgia was among those states we initialed. I have to say, neither Armenia nor Azerbaijan joined such things. The only thing Georgian government abstained from is economic sanctions. And this is to understand for, uh, for huge Russia, our economic sanctions, you know, are like you know, zero. But for Georgia's population, it would be you know, really hard to have the sanctions against Russia. It will come as boomerang. <coughs> so when some Western partners at some really high level say regretfully that Georgia should join the sanctions, you know, I think they just don't understand where we are and how we live this 14 years with Russian tanks standing 30 kilometers from our city, our capital, Tbilisi. It's a strange situation, you know, having this, you know, European orientation and struggling, you know, to be NATO member, yeah, and member of European Union and having these tanks just 30 kilometers away from capital. But, you know, this is what happens here. I have to stress also that starting with 24th of February, and it's pity, but many Ukrainian officials of rather high level, they publicly stated that Georgia should use this historical moment and should make, you know, its raid to Abkhazia or South Ossetia and restore territorial integrity of Georgia. This is time that we're saying now, and you know, uh, I was witnessing that some Western diplomats, European diplomats in private conversations were saying the same. This is for you, you know, this historical moment. I am happy to say that Georgian government responded immediately saying that even if all Russian soldiers will be taken from Abkhazian South Ossetia, even if all Russian ammunition tanks, you know, missiles they have there, and strong missiles, believe me, even if everything is taken out of this regions of Georgia, our government would never ever enter these regions by force. And this is quite important because you know, there were already statements from our Abkhaz and our Ossets, you know, who are there, that they are really afraid that something happens now. Now, no, no, our government assures them you know, through public as well as private channels, I show them, and I'm happy to say that we are here at Sohum University and, you know, Rector Zorab Honorize is doing himself a lot for this, you know, grassroots relations between Abkhaz and Georgia. The same is done by some governmental structures, as already mentioned, without any noise, any so-called PR and any publicity, which is quite important. So the next point is that you know what happens in our region. 
many internationally recognized experts stated back two years ago that the end of an empire, you know, came, empire came to the end when Azerbaijan, you know, reconquered Karabakh with the help of Turkey, also Israeli drones and whatever. When Erdogan and Aliyev declared publicly that they are one nation living in two states, and when they led military parade in Baku. This was the end of Russia's dream about restoration of empire, this well, uh, recognized experts were saying. I would agree. What happens now? We know that in September, there were clashes, there were casualties, and Armenians claim that this time, Azeris attacked Armenian territory. Not the territory that was occupied by Armenia around Karabakh, no. Internationally recognized territory of Armenia. And they, Armenian government, they appealed to Moscow, asking for help because they are in the military unit, uh, union with Russia, or the Gabay, they say, you know. So Russia was obliged to help them. And they got public counsel that there will be no military aid from Russia to Armenia. Now, you know how moods are in Yerevan. They say that Russia is traitor. People gather and say it on all log slogans. And they're preparing, you know, some agreement with, with Azerbaijan. And today, Aliyev is in Tbilisi. That's quite important. They speak about, you know, pipelines, oil, gas pipelines, and that, you know, amount of gas or oil should be raised so that pipelines, they go through Georgia. At the same time, where are guarantees that tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, some sabotage or explosions would not happen here? I just say it because I want everybody to, to feel where we are and how Georgian government feels when he tries, you know, to be more or less active. And the threat is a real threat. And yet we are moving on. So Georgia has its role. You know, we have perfect relations with Azerbaijan, very good relations with Armenia. In spite of, you know, all this, you know, war, a real war between them, and let's hope it ends now, we still keep it. And it's quite important in our days when, let's say, frankly, geopolitical picture in the world is changing. Epoch could be changed very soon, geopolitical. And it happens also in our region, quite intensely. It also already happened, you know, I told you when, two years ago, and it, you know, continues. So I would not say that I know well, perfectly well where is position and should be position of Georgia in such situation. It changes so fast. It's so dynamical. I would agree with Professor Charai. It's too hard to, uh, to predict. But today's challenge is not to make any mistake that could be, you know, very, you know, uh, uh, let's say dangerous and, 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 and uh, bad mistake for Georgia to move through this very difficult position without, you know, well, uh, uh, you know, how to say, being deceived by some provocations. I have to add about internal political situation in Georgia. From the very beginning, I was warning everybody because I know personally well President Sarkashvili, an old friend of mine who is, you know, in jail now, thanks to, you know, uh, 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 active position of our government. And I know his people, his gang, they are split to several factions, but all of them, shout that Georgia has to do more for Ukraine, to send soldiers to Ukraine. They tried to do it publicly, you know. They say that this is you no know, best option, you know, to restore uh, territorial integrity of Georgia and they keep silent. When Russians <laughs> were coming, and the Russians said this is also a problem. You know, since February, you know, dozens of thousands and perhaps over two, two 200,000, you know, people came to Georgia. Only during this day of mobilization, almost 100,000 Russians, you know, crossed border and came to Georgia. Many of them left during a few days, but still, you know, 
So they were saying, close the doors, don't allow them to come, okay? I'm you know, happy that USA said that they are ready to receive all of them as refugees. Germany did the same. And there are many, many Russians now in Tbilisi as well as Armenia, uh, sorry, Ukrainians. And there is not a single clash between them or between them and local population. So let's hope that being you know, so cautious and let's say professionally so far so good, I mean, our government is acting. Let's hope that we will pass this extremely dangerous situation. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, calling for cautious foreign policy, uh, Mr. Mamradze. Uh, it seems like. Uh, Asha, we cannot hear you. Again, you cannot hear me. Let me see here. No, we can hear you fine, Lasha. We We're can good? hear you. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Maya. Um, Lasha. Our next, our next speaker would be. Mr. Kakabadze, sir, you are next. You are up. We would like to hear your thoughts. Can you hear? Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. okay. You can hear me? Okay, excellent. We can hear you, but we're not clear who the next speaker is. Mr. Kakabadze is the next speaker. I think you need to, I think you're on mute. I am mute. Sorry. Okay, okay, there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving such an opportunity. First of all, to see my old friends and in particular, Mr. Zurab Khonelidze, with whom we are related from the, let's say, first day of our independence, of independence of Georgia from 91, dealing with some important issues. And uh, going back to our point, I would like to start with Ukraine. Ukraine is very important state, not only for Georgia or for region, but in the world. By the way, Ukraine was, if I'm not wrong, second or third country who recognized the 91 independence of Georgia. Even we had a big meeting celebrating this event. Then it happened so that in 93, in April, even more precisely, it was 12, 13 April, I organized the first visit of Mr. Shevardnadze to Ukraine, signing a package of new documents between the newly independent states. And one interesting point regarding this, usually we call it frame agreement between two countries. The name is about neighborhood, friendship, and cooperation. But this agreement was named about friendship, neighborhood, cooperation, mutual assistance. And believe me, it was not easy even to sign this agreement that finally, due of, let's say, personal relation between President Kravchuk and Shevardnadze, Kravchuk took this responsibility because there were many oppositional representatives who were against it. And we signed that it happened that then in September, we felt this support from Ukrainian side during the war in Abkhazia, when we faced first among the former Soviets, the aggression of Russia. So it was not a new one when we speak about Russian aggressions. It started in 92. I do not want to go back uh, in 19, 1921, but what we remember and what we witnessed, it really happened so. There were no, no, there were some mercenaries from Northern Caucasus, there were some local groups, but there was a Russian army fighting against us. And Georgia wasn't ready by that time. So Ukraine became a really good friend, a good partner for Georgia. And it happened again so that two times in 96 and in 97, I met as a special envoy of President Chavarnadze to Mr. Kravchuk and Mr. Kuchman later. Again, they supported us on CS meetings and we had the good results by that time. 
Unfortunately, Mr. Mamraza mentioned about 2008, it happened. And uh, my last position was in Sweden and in Finland as an ambassador. And on every meeting, I was underlining that international community made a mistake without leaving without reaction the Russian aggression in Georgia. And please do not do the same again. Unfortunately, it happened. International community was not able to stop Russia. And when we speak about, about, about international community, I want to underline one fact and remind you. In, 94, in 1994, in Budapest, if I'm not in Budapest, it was signed an agreement between Ukraine and international guarantors on exchange of nuclear, when Ukraine refused from nuclear weapons to be the guarantees of territorial integrity of Ukraine. Unfortunately, it did not happen. And it again was violated. So I again may allow myself to say that it's really time to stand with Ukraine. I fully agree with Mr. Amrada that, of course, Georgia doing, is doing his best, in particular in humanitarian field, assisting and international level, supporting any resolution, any decision which is in favor of Ukraine. It is on the UN, or SC, on other EU, or I do not know, but everywhere. Georgia is supporting it. By the way, uh, working in the system of foreign ministry, we had a st strict instructions from foreign ministry to support Ukraine whenever, wherever it was needed. And we were doing that. And probably our system will continue to do the same. Now, Ukraine, how it can impact on international ground. Probably everybody knows the crisis on financial markets, crisis in food supply, and finally, more or less, these questions are slowly, with the participation of Turkey, solving, but still it's not enough. Now, another point is ecological catastrophe, what we hear what we are witnessing, what Russians are saying. And by the way, I want to remind the recent explosions on Baltic seas, this gas pipeline, it did not happen by chance. Who knows Russia? And by the way, for some time, I was ambassador to Russia for two years, by the end of 90s, beginning of 20s. So, Unfortunately, they are able, and sometimes it causes some threat that you know, it's like a conspiracy theory, but they are preparing something, warning in, a, in advanced international community to blame them, Ukraine, or I do not know, any other country. Now about regional. In 91, President Gamsahurdia raised the question or he made a, such a statement and initiated about the creation of common Caucasian house. Then in 96, President Chavarnadze continued this idea and proposed it for the peaceful Caucasus. And really it's an option for the region. And we see now in the Southern Caucasus, I speak about Southern Caucasus only, the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Russia was dealing with this and absolutely unsuccessfully. Unfortunately, it did not give any fruits, any results. And only after international community has been involved, it started to move from the dead point. And I speak now about the broader understanding of regional. It includes Northern Caucasus as well, because it's very sensitive and very explosive region. Nobody knows what happens tomorrow if any six will not go in direct uh, that in the proper direct direction. So we have to take into consideration this phenomena as well, region as a whole, Caucasus, including Northern Caucasus as well. 
And finally, what I wanted to underline, coming back to 94 agreement, international law. Unfortunately, it's not working. And I'm coming to my personal experience dealing with UN Security Council. I had an opportunity to have a statement there four or five times and once in General Assembly. Unfortunately, it's my personal opinion, as far as I'm three person now, UN is not able to solve such acute challenges which face the world. So my opinion is the time has come to change international format of such a bodies as UN, OSCE, because OSCE charter is from the very ground violated when Russia violated first Georgia's territorial integrity and now we see what happens in Ukraine. And I have to remind you about Moldova. So there is a package of the questions and I'm sure that now international community more or less understands the threat which is coming not to Ukraine and not only to Georgia and to other regions of former Soviet, but to Europe as well. So it's time to unite all efforts as they are doing and it's really good start for evaluating situation on the ground and taking clever decision. Thank you very much. I'm, I tried to put myself in limits of seven minutes. So. I think we're okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. I think, uh... This ends the Georgian session, Eric, for now, and uh, over to you. Thank you, Lasha, and thank you so much to our distinguished uh, three speakers from Georgia. I will now turn it over to uh, Maya to uh, respond to the um, prompt of the event. Uh, how uh, has the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine affected the South Caucasus? Arik, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the organizers for including me uh, and, and inviting me in this talk. Honestly, I had very different um, talking points prepared, but after hearing everything, I feel like I completely need to change uh, what I'm going to say in, the, in, in, in my sort of next seven minutes. And I hope I'll get to sort of the other things I wanted to say. Um, First of all, it is actually really refreshing to hear um, these perspectives and to hear the voices of the speakers prior to me, because this is not um, something that we hear a lot in the West. So um, I think for our audience, they can kind of hear um, directly uh, from, from sort of the minority voices in, in Georgia, right? And by minority voices, I mean, people who clearly do not share um, the, the opinions of the majority of Georgians and certainly not the majority of Ukrainians and the Westerners. So uh, with deep respect um, to Professor Mamradze, to uh, Professor um, Obachidze, Gagabadze, I'm sorry. Um, gentlemen, you are touting Russian propaganda talking points. I don't know if you're aware of this or if this is accidental, um, but frankly, I am outraged to hear essentially direct quoted some of the most popular Russian propaganda talking points in this situation and on this subject matter. So you say things like for, you know, Georgian populations, it would be really hard to join the if, if Georgia joined the economic sanctions against Russia. Um, on the other hand, the Georgian prime minister has come out and said things like in, in early to mid-October and throughout the year, he has said that Georgia has been consistently enjoying double digit economic growth, that Georgia is among the top five countries in terms of its economic gro growth, excuse me, right next to countries like Switzerland. So which one is it? Is the Georgian economy so broken that it cannot ex it cannot even afford to um, join the rest of the most of the civilized world, if you will, in sanctioning um, a country that has occupied Georgia's 20% of Georgia's territory and also a country that's waging a war against Ukraine. So Georgia cannot afford 
to join these sanctions in, in the sort of the name of solidarity with its Ukrainian brothers. Although when, when Georgia was attacked in 2008, it received plenty of support and solidarity from whether that was Ukraine or the European Union or the United States. So that one's really sort of surprising. So which one is it? Can Georgia not afford sanctions? It's so broke. Or does it have a two-digit economic growth and um, is right up there with Switzerland in terms of um, how well its economy doing apparently. Um, the you know there there's so many things that that you've just said. I don't even know where to begin from. Georgia is doing its best to support Ukraine. Yet if you look at it even from just the perspective of the European neighborhood countries, the trio, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia is the only one that did not receive the candidate status from the European Union when it petitioned the European Union along with Ukraine and Moldova for candidate status because um, it was told that it has a huge issue with uh, with oligarchies, with this justice system. Georgia is not an exception in this region. Moldova was able to really take advantage of this opportunity in the face of the war in Ukraine. It chose to be on the right side of, of history. And this is how Moldova ended up with uh, EU candidate status. You can tell me that Georgia is in an incredibly peculiar geopolitical position. I agree with you completely. Um, but does that mean that you have to have the kind of appeasement policy that um, your, uh, you have a unilateral uh, visa-free regime with Russia. Yes, you don't have technically a uh, diplomatic relationship with Russia, but I would argue that's even worse. You have no official diplomatic relationship with Russia, yet you have economic trade and you have a one-way visa-free system according to which Russians can come into Georgia in um, any number, and remain for, for one year. So um, none of the speakers before me mentioned the fact that um, if you check any of the news sources, if you just look around in the streets in Tbilisi, right, you see Russians everywhere. And just in the month of October, according to some statistical information, 50,000 Russians uh, fled to Georgia. Um, so what you are seeing is a serious um, danger and a security issue. The security issue is not the fact that if Georgia sided with the rest of the world and certainly the rest of the West and sort of had a tougher policy towards Russia, that it introduced some kind of way to account for how many Russians are coming into Georgia, how long they're staying, what property buying rights they have. That would not start a war with Russia. Russia is very busy right now fighting a war with Ukraine. Right. None of that. Some transparency and some accountability from the Georgian government in terms of who's coming into Georgia from Russia, how long they're staying, what they're buying up, how much money is being laundered through Georgia. That would be really useful. And I promise you that would not start a war, despite the fact that the Russian tanks are very close by. Um, what would start a war is. If we, if we just continue to see the numbers of Russians pouring into Georgia with Russophobia, frankly, dialing up to, to previously unseen numbers, there is a ticking bomb in Georgia right now in terms of Russophobia. And at some point, we're going to start seeing clashes, right, or some kind of ethnic-based confrontations in Georgia, like, you know, a little bit of the taste that we got of it, right, at the Dedaena restaurant that has these sort of outlandish, frankly, policies about the Russians entering the restaurant, right? So you have to get the, what they call the visa, which is this array, these, this array of declarations against Putin and in support of Ukraine, if you don't want to go in there, if you don't sign those, you're not allowed to go in there. That that's that that's a bit much, right? But you're only going to see an increase in the in the number of incidents in Russophobia. So eventually, right, that's the biggest fear that that Georgia will sort of become the place where these accidents or incidents of of ethnic based or or linguistic based issues happen. Um, and, and frankly, that's one of the biggest concerns in terms of security concerns vis-a-vis -vis the, the fallout of this war, which is 
what happens when Putin decides that Russians are being harassed in Georgia and he needs to come in to protect um, to, to protect uh, ethnic Russians in Georgia that are being harassed? I would say that's a greater danger right now than the location of the Russian tanks in South Ossetia, Tsvinvali region or, or in Abkhazia. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like many of these talking points that I've heard are kind of of refreshing because we don't hear them in English as much. Um, but at the same time, again, they're a repetition of a lot of sort of the Russian propaganda talking points I've heard. I'll just add one more. I actually don't even know, know my, my time limit because I'm just really outraged at what I heard. But, um, you know, this, this argument of, oh, do you want a war? If you have a tougher policy on Russia, if you literally put in three, four, five policies in place that will simply be more transparent, more in accordance with sort of the way the West is approaching this, that, oh, you want a war? Omiginda, this is what you hear a lot. Um, this is literally the same argument as Putin saying, I will nuke Ukraine. So if because of, of the nuclear weapons that, that Putin is threatening the rest of the world with, the West should not support Ukraine and Ukraine should roll over and, and give up. I'll just add one more thing before I stop, but I have plenty more to say. But, um, you know, I was going to talk all about how the Russians that are pouring into Georgia from the border and certainly into Turkey as well, but let's focus on Georgia in this case. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion right now in Georgia. The, you know, most of the things we just talked about aren't really the things that are that that bother the Georgian society. What bothers them is so now the occupant occupier is the refugee. Do we treat these people as refugees just in the month of, like I said, I, we don't even have the, the exact stats as to who's coming in and staying for how long. But let's say in the month of October, they're saying that 50,000 Russian, mostly deserters, came into Georgia since Putin declared that, um, you know, the, the mobilization. Um, so the arguments are, what is our humanitarian responsibility here for the people who are at the border and oftentimes crossing on foot? You know, do we help them out? Um, is the occupier now the refugee? And if so, what are the Ukrainians who are actually being bombed and who are actual refugees? Um, more than that, you know, we think about things like, well, if we let the deserters come into Georgia, is that sort of one, one fewer person who's committing genocides in Ukraine, right? If they're in Georgia peacefully, does that mean that they're not in Ukraine murdering Ukrainian children and women? Um, these are, you know, there are a lot of morality questions here, um, you know, and, and of course the arguments are, you know, it's very difficult to overthrow Putin. You want us to stay home and fight our government, but we can't, and we are sort of we don't want to go to Ukraine to kill people, so we are running to Georgia. And then for that, you know, that sounds like a really good argument, but then a lot of my colleagues in Georgia have pointed out, perhaps people from my generation and younger, um, this is eight months into the war, and they're fleeing Russia now. They're not against the war, they're against participating in the war. These are some of the big questions that we need to be focusing on, not the questions of oh, Georgia cannot afford to sanction Russia because, um, you know, its economy is suffering so much. Um, I feel like that's like a level 25 question, considering the dire situation in Ukraine and how the world has united against Ukraine. Just one last thing that I believe this has been a, the great unmasking of the Georgian government and the Georgian people. Uh, Maya, we have lost we your voice. About we can't hear you. Okay, can Maya. you can you guys hear now? Maya, I can still hear you. I can I can hear you, Maya. Okay. I guess my internet is a little unstable because I am in Georgia. So this is not these are not talking points coming from Philadelphia. I I've been in Georgia you. for a few months now and I understand what's going on there. So some people cannot hear me, so I'll stop here. Um Adi, can you hear me okay? Yes, Maya, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll stop here, but thank you so much for giving me this platform. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, it's always a positive conversation. So now I will turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Talia Farrow, uh, the final panelist.
Well, thank you, Arik, for inviting me and uh, to this very lively panel. And it's wonderful to see Lasha again. I'm thank going you. to begin by acknowledging uh, my privilege as someone who is currently speaking to you from Boston, Massachusetts in the United States. And I'm also gonna begin by acknowledging that I am not an expert on the geopolitics of the South Caucasus. Um, I have only traveled to the South Caucasus once. I was in Armenia uh, for five days in July, along with a group of colleagues from the Fletcher School from the uh, Russia and Eurasia program, uh, in which we had uh, a series of meetings with faculty colleagues at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. Instead, what I'm going to do is offer a somewhat more detached perspective as somebody who is not on the ground in either the South Caucasus and certainly not in Ukraine. One thing that has become apparent to me from the remarks uh, from our Georgian interlocutors is an acute awareness of Georgia's vulnerability by virtue of its geographic proximity to Russia and by virtue of Russia's a support for separatists in Abkhazia and, uh, and South Ossetia. Uh, regardless of whether the Ukraine war in and of itself has had a deleterious effect on Georgia's economy, uh, it seems to me that the Georgian government's response to the war, its reluctance to impose economic sanctions on Russia, uh, and its uh, somewhat tepid uh, 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 support for, uh, for Ukraine is stemming largely from geopolitical vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Uh, you know, speaking again as a scholar in the United States, I'm 5,000 miles removed from this conflict. And so therefore I have the luxury of having a more detached perspective because, well, Russia hasn't occupied Massachusetts and it's not bombing uh, students. It's not bombing innocent civilians in Boston. It's bombing you know, innocent civilians in Kiev, in Kiev, in uh, the uh, Luhansk, in the Donbass, in Kershaw, in other places. The fear that uh, many experts had you know, when this war broke out in February was that Russia would quickly overrun uh, Ukraine, would quickly affect regime change in Kyiv. Uh, and that has not turned out to, to be the case. This is going to be a grinding war, and it's a war that has shown many twists and turns. Uh, when we were in Armenia in July, no one, no one, on either the American or the Russian side thought the Ukraine would be capable of retaking territory that had been occupied by the Russian army. And that's precisely what they've been doing for the past two months. The interest of the United States with respect to the Ukraine war and with respect to the South Caucasus has always been one of stability. Uh, you know, our long-term objective is for Russia to lose the war in Ukraine, although there's not much specificity on the part of the Biden administration as to what a loss would mean, what a loss would look like other than a restoration of the territorial status quo in Ukraine prior to the 24th of February. But with respect to the South Caucasus, it's the position of the Biden administration that they do not want to see, uh, you know, Russia use military force against any of the Soviet successor states, do not want to see Russia escalate any of the frozen conflicts uh, in that part of the world, which have been ongoing for 30 years. It's also clear that the United States is rather tepid in uh, you know, advocating for the inclusion of South Caucasian states in NATO and in uh, the European Union, although the United States doesn't get a vote with respect to the European Union. No one in the United States is talking about uh, Georgia as a candidate member of NATO. And there's actually very little uh, uh, appetite at this point for uh, inviting Ukraine to be a, a, a member of NATO at this point. Yes, Sweden and Finland uh, are on a fast track to, to NATO membership, but they have a very different geopolitical uh, profile. 
They are advanced industrial states. They bring military capabilities to uh, the alliance, and they would be useful uh, in terms of defending the Baltics. Uh, that is not the position that any of the states in the South Caucasus are in. So while I don't have a personal stake in the conflict in Ukraine, and I certainly don't have a personal stake in the geopolitics of the South Caucasus, it has been interesting for me as an American-born, American-situated scholar of international relations to be part of these discussions and to learn about the constraints under which Georgia's government and people operate. Um, I don't envy you uh, having Russia as a neighbor. And I will end my remarks there and turn it back to uh, Arik and Lasha. Thank you. Um, Lasha, did you want to say something? I, I just wanted to quickly, uh, yes, uh, uh, make just a very brief comments. Um, we, you and I were looking, I think, for a lively discussion and we got it. So I think uh, this is a success. Um, uh, here is the thing. Um, I, I want to build off sort of what Maya said. Um, it's undeniable that there are problems uh, in terms uh, of what Maya said. I'm not going to repeat every single category of that uh, analysis. Um, and um, I wish, I do wish that um, there was more, you know, there were more transparency uh, within the government, but counting on governments having transparency, I think only comes out of strong checks and balances and societal demands um, that Georgia has always sort of um, experienced the deficit of. But be that as it may, um, I, I, you know, it's inescapable um, and we should not avoid the fundamental reality here that uh, history has not ended. Uh, it's been with us, it is with us, it's going to be with us for a long time to come. Um, geopolitics is an ugly, world, uh, ugly word in Georgia. Um, I admit it, I know. Um, Unfortunately, we have to face it. We have to understand the true meaning of it. We have to understand the meaning and concept of what state interest means. We have to understand the concept of our neighborhood and where we find ourselves as Georgians. Um, and this is uh, a quite frankly, a existential threat, which any state, not just an impoverished minions like Georgia, any state is concerned with and should be concerned with how to survive in the international system. And it's an extremely risky environment. Uh, it's always been a risky environment. It's the difference is that it's been covered up by the 30 years of NATO talk. I hate to say that people won't like what I'm saying. I understand my fellow Georgians, uh, but the idea that somehow we are going to become members of NATO or the European Union, much less, uh, I hate to say it, but you know, this, is, this has been a chimera right from the start. The divided, you know, in terms of Western standards, Georgia does not constitute um, a state. It constitutes, we want it to be a state, but it's a divided country. It's got an occupying force, uh, a military on its land. What NATO are we discussing here? And so the idea that pragmatism must be taken out of this analysis or that, you know, sure, yeah, absolutely. Keep believing in it. I support your belief in it, whoever it is. I am wholeheartedly one day wish that Georgia became member of the civilized West. But, you know, we have to survive as a state before we get there. And, the, and I think that the policies, these blindfold policies of leading somewhere across the precipice, uh, which is the final, you know, across the precipice, um, you know, screaming and yelling NATO and European Union um, hasn't really delivered. And there, is, there are other theories out there. There are other, other analysis out there that must be brought into this mix uh, or this single-minded vision, if you will. There is no mix, I wish there were. Uh, and sort of rebalance um, this single-minded tunnel vision that one day, sure, one day maybe, there is no saying that we will never become NATO members, but you gotta survive to get there as a state first. And I have not seen serious analysis done in the Georgian academia, nor in the government, 
about this issue. It's almost like it's uh, it's it's almost you. They will they will chastise you publicly publicly if you say something that will be oriented more towards pragmatic foreign policy. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end with that commentary. Uh, Arik, uh, let's not forget uh, the rector. Uh, maybe we can uh, curve out some time for for, <laughs> for the rector to say a couple of things as well. But um, I'm uh, I'm over to you. Thank you, Lasha. Um, we're happy to give uh, Mr. Kanalize some time to speak if he would like, but I would also uh, like to give the opportunity to our audience uh, to ask questions. So if you have a question, please uh, type it in the chat or raise your hand on Zoom and we will call on you because we have this next half hour for Q&A. Mr. Connellise, would you like to uh, make a yeah. 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 translation anywhere? Um, I'll be the one and only presenter, which will be speaking in in mother tongue, and uh, yeah, will uh, address to the audience in the mother tongue. So uh, we'll be followed. And and I'd like to share the and state the this like warm uh, greetings from in, in the name of the Sohomi State University and also Sohomi State University uh, Educational Center to the audience. Um, uh, after the the, uh, the speaking part of the um, Ismaya, he reminded the the the, uh, the words of the Eleanor Roosevelt, who is as follows: Great minds talk. Talk about ideas. Average minds talk about events. And small minds talk about people. Um, if, uh, as it is, it's, if it's not the part of the reality to become the part of the, um, the reality of the... Of the um, it's, it's part of the, the real number of amount of the people and um, can, can be addressed from the... Small amount of the people. You're the one of the brightest minds that you can rely on. Idea. The idea. But also to really protect that idea. Coronavirus. <laughs> As it comes to your uh, knowledge after the pandemic and later coming up the, the war and the uh, Ukrainian tra tragic process of the, the war, uh, those, ideologies, uh, those ideologies about the politics, geopolitical directions and the regional um, differentiation uh, really, really changed the civilized world and among them, the, the, the lifestyle of the people. And uh, as it comes to the to the knowledge of the people and uh, knowledge of the, um, uh, is is better. Okay. Uh, uh, as it happens, so okay. What happens in, uh, within the world and within the environment around us? Uh, it's really uh, it's hard, it's full of the hardship and uh, full of the problems around it, and those uh, the mindsets of the world really changed. Uh, so the analysis of those uh, arranged events uh, really uh, leads us to to follow the philosophical uh, changes. So those deepen uh, strategic strategic minds and uh, kind of a visual who can be uh, really, really reinforced with the true and the fresh intellectual uh, arguments. Um, uh, so that can be, uh, so those kind of the mindset can really, really get back to the human beings, the, the thoughts, the kind of the 
power and uh, belief of the fun uh, fundamental uh, uh, fundamental um, kind of the um, the powers fundamental ideas about it the first first and foremost uh, uh, we are and he you really thought about the freedom uh, justice and love um, but also uh, it's a really intellectual belief that uh, uh, those kind of things uh, really really uh, like brings to the higher uh, quality of intellectual uh, uh, kind of the uh, the power, the intellectual, uh, higher um, material, uh, those kind of the things that creates uh, all around it, and uh, the modern world uh, around. Uh, uh, yeah, so the modern wor world does not allow a country to effectively control all internal and external threats uh, independently. Uh, so the self-isolation, even by oriental, um, uh, by ori orientation towards any word or civilization, based on the above, uh, it become a requirement of the time. They need to acquire an international function. Um, the only real way for Georgia to achieve it is to have a peaceful uh, coexistence with other nations and additional interest of the main regulation in global politics and to protect the balance of the world's regulating forces. So that's Georgian state has not only the attractiveness, but also the needs and necessity and in the way to be able to regionally integrate into the system of international relation. Um, so the strengths of Georgian state, whose strengths lies uh, into its diversity and it's effectively lies to also the expansion of uh, operational space area, the most important geopolitical, geoeconomic, military, political, or intellectual, and etc. The resource lies uh, precisely on the plane of integrative processes. So uh, what we really follow here, uh, the, the source that we might continue here would be um, also, uh, as it comes to it, our knowledge, the Caucasus is a single region which consists of two geopolitical parts, a uh, space, but by a single regional space, uh, meaning those Caucasus. So it means uh, um, um, gathering Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and the single regional space of the Soviet states, the priority. Uh, here, uh, designation of the organizing center of which has been assigned to Georgia since its uh, time, uh, uh, we can't really, uh, it's, it's immense here. Um, so in, within the region, we can see internal and uh, like open and hidden interests, uh, hidden interests of the, uh, by one side in strategy of the common regional space, which, um, which is kind of the necessary, it, it really needs to joint decision making by their participants. So the geopolitical centers of the world's dominant and regional leaders, states, transitional cor uh, corporations, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so uh, as it comes to the like the bottom line of the South Caucasus uh, 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 unified security system uh, and its transformation into a new peaceful space under the one umbrella is the happy re reconciliation of global, regional, and national interests without uh, disobeying and enslaving each other in order to generate additional benefits. Um, and here, um, as we see, here comes this, the peaceful parting. Um, would be great if we can, the audience, we can take some questions and uh, we really go deeper to the discussion. Yes, Arik, I think we've, get, we've been getting um, plenty of questions. Um, okay, it looks like there are your... a couple of questions in the chat already and so we can have uh, any of the panelists uh, respond to them. The first question is from Lerna. How does the calculation change for Georgia after the Armenia-Azerbaijan uh, conflict uh, escalated yet again uh, on September 13th and 14th? Would anyone like to address this or perhaps respond to some of the comments made earlier?
any one of the panelists, I guess, can pick up on that, right? You're welcome to simply unmute yourselves. Okay. Well, I'll we just say a quick couple yeah, of no, words. No. So, you know, there's a lot you can say about the Armenia Azerbaijan conflict and, you know, what that says about um, sort of the regional security uh, paradigm, but also the West's role perhaps in the region. I, I think I mentioned earlier this notion of uh, the Armenianization of Georgia. And what I mean by that is how the West has sort of become accustomed to treating Armenia. Uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh war, when it sort of rebroke out a couple years ago, I thought it was a terrible tragedy. Um, and a big part of that is the way the United States and certainly the West, right, treated it. It was um, a big deal, yet not a big deal. There was not a lot done about it. And, you know, sort of Russia swoops in and it looks like Russia is really the security guarantor in the South Caucasus region. Um, and, and, you know, the U.S. especially is really nowhere to be seen what what the U.S. did to kind of help um, um, and, and you know, so there was a lot of fear there that, okay, so this looks like is my Can you guys hear me? Okay. So your voice is really on conflict. I think my internet may be unstable, so can, can you guys hear me okay? Maya, I can hear you fine now. Yeah. Me too, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we can hear you I'm... here. We can hear you in the States, but. Okay. Um, so what I was saying is, you know, so then it clearly looked like, okay, so Russia is the security guarantor in, in places like Armenia and Azerbaijan where the West is not just not as invested. Um, but the ceasefire won't hold. And I think this just speaks volumes about Russia as a security guarantor that you know sounds like an oxymoron to to most of us um so that's one thing i would say that somehow the russia backed and russia brokered you know peace is is really uh not something that you can see in practice in the real world it's on, only there on paper that's one part of you know, sort of the many things that I could I could say about this this terrible conflict that's a tragedy. Thanks, Maya. Uh, so I'll read the next uh, two questions from the chat. Uh, the first is by uh, Itakin, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name. Uh, what is the role of uh, sorry, national sorry, interruption? Can I jump in? Parties? I'm sorry. Uh, like Mr. Rector would like to have the reflection on the question, so we might hear. Please go ahead, Mr. Cohen. Yes. Uh, conflict in region. Will stop some of the Caucasus. That's really bullish. Conflict with the region, meaning the South Caucasus isn't over. Conflict is being generated. Either Caucasus or what? Ongoing conflict, really highlighted. From Karabakh is problem. Through um, the Karabakh problem. Azerbaijan Between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Um, problem. So called Sosia and the like internal problem of the Georgia. And um, like uh, made um, made um, mistakes beforehand. Um, meaning the formal internalization. Will come into the consensus only one way. The joint regional context. Because this the this problem is the, the joint regional problem. Which extends and it's a global problem, not only regional one. To Guinda, Abhazet, the Sankratos, Timo Abrun, Sakartelush. We have to Shudoba, 
we have to go back to within the region, like go back and really find the resolution here within inside the region between as well addressing the, the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Am procesi çöni üniversite diari aktiura çaktırdı. Ve çöni samşıda bu centri gelen tülebiz. During this process, uh, our university, Sakhmi Saiti University, our education central are really actively involved. Çöni mğare hepsi, Sakhem tipos Azerbaycan ve Sakhem tipos Sobhets. Between the states of the Azerbaijan and state of Armenia. Kartuli pozitsi danga on dinari, bu nebrevi ya Sakhem tipos. From the point of view of the Georgian state. Şev tavazet samkri ve ürtertu biz formapi. Offered the one-sided uh, uh, like cooperation uh, uh, agreements. The whole type of schedule, that's the bully academy or it. The important part is our university to diplomatic and discuss so how we can support our university. And all kind of the um, the meetings, starting from the academic part, will be uh, delivered and uh, will be established at the university. Cartoon is a kind of post. Kansakutrebul roles, rats are is to irti the Pasukis Gablo, but are with a shirt to worship Pupuneva. Like to share the the kind of the burden of the 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 government of Georgia, the state of Georgia, not so Miss Ajerebus, Ariarebs, Ertiz the Milwitz. So the necessity of the uh, of, of these, it's really um, acknowledged uh, from both sides. Ne mi dost orati koz gage buli. Kak niz damo ki de buli. Khali sukla biz rotsa is sau brops. Ne itra ur pozitsias. It it's really need to be clearly understood the 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 point of the state when it talks about about the the peace and. Esaris kolo dis rops. Sakar tulo armit se stavis tau sukla biz itse sm karet. So this is a point when uh, Georgia doesn't allow itself to uh, become the, the part, the side of the conflict. But on, but on the contrary, it's a very active to keep the peacekeeping. And one of the uh, really practical, uh, like the state and the occasion is the university environment. Where well, the space environment is the uh, and the language itself is academic. The, the space where the, the, the freedom is its highest level, meaning the academic freedom. Since the Sadat Sarah is not very spirit, but Hare Shoris, Arst Haube Shoris, the Arts Vetsinere of Shoris. Space, there's there's no any kind of the uh, rivalry kind of the between the professors, between the generations. We will check with Ra, the army, the Molen of Davas, the Magram, and we are she gave me a Huchan. The first meeting will be on this within this week on uh, a Thursday. As you can buy El Chep Shoris, Shekhwedra, Azerbaijan is El Chisda, some pretty selfishes. That will be the meeting between the ambassadors from Armenia and from Azerbaijan. And um, exact uh, understanding of the, the, the date itself, it's kind of found. Azerbaijan is president. The one hand, uh, the head of the state of Azerbaijan kind of uh, shared the idea of cooperation from their side. We have the working agenda aligned and the second meeting. Follow soon. Universities rector. Azerbaijan is Bukhare. The Sami Sonket is Bukhare. Religious leader of Tanerta. Three deans of the universities from Azerbaijan and then equally three deans of the universities of Armenia within the uh, religious leaders. Uh, we're trying to organize the really high representative meetings who are uh, also influencing the ideas of their nations and uh, kind of directing their mindsets within their countries. That's why we're going to be talking about the 
uh, of course, we are planning to have the also um, external meetings outside of the current meetings. <laughs> One of, the, one of the most important meetings are kind of planning within the uh, like in USA, but this like really in the in the level of the planning so far. Which gives a different lab and impulse of those ongoing events. Some kretos it is the Arabahis problem. It's a very moguare body problem. I'm very much sure that the problem of Abkhazia, so that Ossetia, um, uh, also um, um, Armenia, Azerbaijan, meaning the Karabakh conflict is, is political reveli, rats and sakure, but conflict is the regular bus. The political level, which really serves to uh, balance the conflict. Romulci Chartuli area. Where are involved the governmental institutions, all the level of the institutions, basically the ones who are. Ara samu kala samu kala ara samtaro sectori. Okay, yeah, like the the ones from coming from the NGO sector and also the uh, public servants, like international organizations. Mati Monatileba, Drum da Dastura, Aris Outsilabeli Piroba, Taregulis Procession, Magram Outsilabel, Sulla da Sarishna Sakmaris. Involving uh, the role within those ongoing process uh, it is as essential, but not the only like the the ones were um, not enough. Thomas Axna Agda Mizesia, Titoli Madgani, Madganis Resociari Shazuduli. Each and everyone's uh, resources are kind of the restricted. Interests are different. That's in the Gobashi Modis at one. And they're coming uh, contra contradiction with each other. Da, Dalian Shirat, Beuri Madgani, Arim Sakure, Arim Sakureba conflicts, Piriki, Dim Sakureb's conflicts. But uh, in most cases, they're not serving the conflicts, but they're issuing or like Academic creating the uh, Academic environment gathers all those resources to develop within the direction of the trend. Transform Tawadget conflict is real or it's armosho bismizes. Tak air touch with stebit, most not, Mrs. Apuzu. We're trying to find the reason of the conflict and we try to resolve this conflict within this manner. Okay, I think we have a couple of minutes left. So, Arik, um, <clears throat> did you want to maximize those last few minutes? Thanks, Lasha. Well, I think we probably don't have time to answer the two remaining questions, but I'll finish reading them uh, aloud. So uh, there was a question about uh, the role of uh, nationalist parties or groups in the South Caucasus in terms of uh, building a peaceful region with our all neighbors. And then we also had a question from Professor uh, Rocky Whites, my colleague uh, at Fletcher, uh, with the Black Sea becoming a more active front in the Russia-Ukraine war, how do you think this could affect maritime security and trade flows uh, for Georgia? Um, we are um, almost out of time at this point, but if someone would like to spend a couple of minutes uh, responding to those questions or what the panelists have said previously, uh, we will give the floor to you. So one final comment. This is this is the most challenging part to fit it in 30 seconds. I think what Mr. Vaktan Charaya wants to do it. Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, 
let me say that um, the situation around Georgia uh, is not so easy as it could be seen from United States, let's say. Uh, the situation here is really fragile and uh, uh, it's really very much complicated. It's not so easy to say that Georgia should, uh, it's very easy to say that Georgia should do more, but at the same time, the risks Georgia uh, may face are also, are also uh, really huge. So we have to balance right now uh, because um, as it was uh, said here by different uh, speakers, uh, Georgia is not uh, kind of able to uh, dictate its own policy or Georgia is not rich enough or so much rich that it can influence uh, the Russian economy or uh, is able to support Ukrainian economy at a scale that it will be significant at uh, any point. So considering uh, the fact that Georgia is poor, uh, to be honest, uh, and uh, unfortunately weak state, uh, it's not so easy to blame, it's very easy to blame Georgia that uh, it's not doing enough, but at the same time, uh, it's not really uh, acceptable. Uh, acceptable uh, from my perspective, let's say that um, Georgia, Georgia, uh, Georgia is not doing anything, or Georgia has Georgia has to do more, or something at uh, that direction. In that direction, uh, Georgia, uh, from my perspective uh, personally, Georgia has done uh, quite much to support Ukraine. It has done quite much uh, to limit Russian, uh, Russian uh, interest and opportunities uh, through Georgia uh, in regard to Ukraine. And Georgia is doing quite much to support also um, European Union in, uh, and United States in their policies. Uh, even uh, European states are not able to do what they really want uh, to do. Um, I can give you just one example. Uh, a few months ago, you remember that um, uh, all, almost all European nations said that they would not pay in rubles for the Russian gas. But nowadays we see everyone is paying and they are getting the Russian gas, yes? So uh, despite the fact that uh, uh, some uh, countries uh, are articulating uh, in a way that they want to show that they are doing uh, really uh, much against Russia. At the same time, we see that uh, a lot of businesses from, let's say, um, uh, European countries are presented on the Russian market even today, even despite the fact that different countries uh, promoted their businesses to leave Russia, or even uh, said it um, openly that they have to leave, they will leave a Russian market and something like that. But it's not so easy to do. That's what I want to say. I'm not blaming uh, anyone that uh, uh, um, uh, that let's say some European countries why they did, did not do this or that but at the same time Georgia also should not be blamed uh, uh, that Georgia is uh, is not doing enough. Georgia is poor, weak unfortunately with two occupied territories within uh, the country and uh, uh, requesting this kind of um, uh, this country uh, to do the same let's say as United States can do or Germany or France, uh, I don't believe it's really uh, acceptable uh, for Georgia and is in the interest of uh, Georgia. Uh, Mrs. Maya may disagree. She is uh, shaking her hand, uh, head uh, really actively, but- You are literally uh, arguing I, against I, I Georgia's sovereignty right now. The, I am so uh, sorry, the, but you are. Uh, uh, from the expert's point of view, not from the political point of view. So that's <laughs> my position. Thank you. Thank uh, you so much for your expertise. I am so sorry to ask you to go over by a minute, but Mr. Vartang Charaya would respectfully is literally agreeing, arguing against Georgia's sovereignty. Georgia is poor and weak, I quote. I really hope you can sort of, you know, check with the Georgian government talking points, make sure that they use the same talking points at home in Georgia as they do on the international stage, because I feel like you're touting their talking points which is very much in according to the Russian government's talking points about Georgia, but um, Georgia is poor and weak. And uh, these are your you know, direct words. So 
I'm I'm absolutely shocked by the words you're saying because everything you just said. And you don't agree if, with this statement? If I had no expertise about Georgia, then you know you have all the expertise. So then my comment would be, Georgia should not be a sovereign state. It might as well become you know a satellite state of Russia. I'm afraid that's kind of where we are driving at in in this conversation. And I have to say, you know, that's just not not true. So. Mrs. Maya, it's your political statement. I understand it, but uh, I have zero political affiliations. I have zero. Mm. You can absolutely not say that I have zero political connections and you zero. You can check GDP per capita of Georgia. Let's say its military potential. How many military force we have? Let's say uh, how many soldiers of Russia are within the Georgian uh, city, not uh, within the Georgian territory, and. Uh, Please uh, say uh, something opposite after that, after checking those numbers. Let's, you, you know, I would let's say, absolutely love to okay, have a conversation right, with you uh, after so this. Almost 100,000 um, USD and 5,000 of Georgian. Uh, I really hope capital. I get to talk to you after this. Uh, this, level, this was, uh, look, look, look. Simply <laughs> possible to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, Excuse please. Excuse me, let's I, not, I this, have to go to another Zoom meeting. Yes. I want to thank you very much for inviting me to participate. This is not necessary. So we had a very productive, I believe, uh, very informative conversation. Um, again, we were kind of shooting for this, but perhaps not to this extent. Uh, I hope that uh, all the guests enjoyed uh, the conference and got something positive and negative out of it. Uh, and perhaps they can analyze it independently. Well, as your uh, first, can we have the final words from the rector? It's like really, really. Arik, uh, are you with me on this? Shall we, you know, do we have a couple more minutes or? That's okay. Yes, please. Either. All right. I call out on my position. Mrs. Shekhadule, I'm sure you're not going to be able to do that. Where are you going to be able to do that? I'm going to be able to do that. I'm going to be able to do that. The point of view of Ms. Maya is a, is a, a, it's a fault of ours uh, because we couldn't deliver the objective and real information from Georgia. Medquin Chagig did summit with seen Chen Konda online Shekwedra conferencia Ukrainis rector epta or Mods Dawot Humaglis Sasolabeli Rebul of the Monotilova, Sirita that rector ebi. Was three months ago we had a meeting with the Ukrainian uh, higher education institutions, 44 of them usually uh, participating in this meeting. Cartoli commentary is Gareshe, Mindaro Mous Minot, Mats. Rogori Madli Rebiaria, Imts Armoud Ganelib, Hardacheris Twist, Datana Gomis Twist, Ratsas Kartoli Sakhentipo, Ukraine Halkis Visamartik. And they are sharing their thoughts, uh, how grateful they are, how the, how grateful they are to the Georgia and Georgia government, what they're uh, give, uh, delivering and getting from the Georgia. The Dartsman and Mulivaro Kalbat and Maya Satsky Shades will have Armoud Ganel. And uh, we're and he sure that uh, the this idea and the, those those suits would be changed and transformed after hearing and uh, hearing this uh, meeting that we may share later. We'll share this uh, video to you tomorrow. I don't like it, please. Mr. Rasham, all right, sounds good. Thank you very much, Mr. Rector, Didi Madloba. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending. Arik, I think we are done here, right? Yes, thank you everyone. Okay. For this was an excellent conference. Talk Professor Talibero, the Georgian team, thank you all for being here. Maya, thank you very much for being here. It was, it was a nice, nice discussion you provoked. Take care, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye.